For an ex-president facing 88 felony counts, just weeks away from becoming the first ever ex-president to be tried on criminal charges, a lesson today from a judge with a steely spine that words do indeed have consequences. Donald Trump is, as of about an hour ago, now under a gag order in the criminal case brought by the Manhattan DA alleging a cover-up of hush money payments. New York Judge Juan Mershon barring Trump from attacking or directing others to attack potential witnesses, jurors, prosecutors, and court staff. The ex-president is allowed to make statements about District Attorney Alvin Bragg. In his ruling, the judge saying that the need to protect the integrity of the process from a defendant with one of the biggest platforms in the world, as trial neared, pushed him to issue this order. Quote, given that the eve of trial is upon us, it is without question that the imminency of the risk of harm is paramount. The ruling was issued just hours after Trump made two statements that would arguably have violated the gag order. Times reports this, quote, in a rambling and angry post on his social media site Tuesday, Trump made an ominous reference to Michael Cohen, claiming without explanation that his former fixer was, quote, death. He also referred to one of Mr. Bragg's prosecutors in pejorative terms. The statements merely proving the point Judge Mershon makes in his ruling that Donald Trump's rhetoric is not just... Trump exercising his First Amendment rights and responding to allegations and attacks from political opponents, as his lawyers claim. And we should point out, he's not running against any of the prosecutors who have charged him. Judge Mershon says that Trump's statements, quote, went far beyond defending himself against attacks by public figures. Indeed, his statements were threatening, inflammatory, denigrating, and the targets of his statements range from local and federal officials, court and court staff, prosecutors and staff assigned to the cases, and private individuals, including grand jurors, performing their civic duties. Such inflammatory extrajudicial statements undoubtedly risk impeding the orderly administration of this court. Wow. That's where we start today with some of our most favorite reporters and friends. With me at the table once again, MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin is here. Also joining us, once again, former top official of the Department of Justice and MSNBC legal analyst Andrew Weissman and former senator and co-host of MSNBC's How to Win 2024 podcast. Our dear friend Claire McCaskill is here. Um, you two should just, you know, park it here and, 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 and stop thinking you're going to be anywhere else at four. But it, it, I don't want to go one more minute without saying this should never feel normal. Someone who was the country's president and someone who would like to be given that privilege again, represents such an imminent, I'm just, I'm Judge Ludig's testimony in January 6th is clanging in my head. Donald Trump is a clear and present danger. Clearly, this judge, Andrew Weissman, thought he was a clear and present danger to his trial. I think if you put up the last slide that you just were reading from, it, it that's exactly what I was thinking, that it is so chilling that you have yet another judge saying about, it's not somebody who not only was the former president, but is now the leading Republican candidate, that this is what the country has come to. When history is written, they will look at this in terms of a real fight for the soul of, of our country. And in terms of what the judiciary has had to do to stand up to a real attack on what it means to be American, what it, it means to have a rule of law in this country. Uh, Judge Mershon should be lauded for doing this. Um, as he said, he in one of his the quotes from his decision is, I do not need to wait, um, essentially, until the violence has occurred to take action. And it's also notable that he issued this not as to all parties. He issued this gag order as to the one person before him who has shown that he has the propensity to do this and has done this in the past. That is Donald Trump. That is, this, that is the, the exclusive scope of this gag order. And that is the person who used to be the president of the United States, and that is a sign of where we are as a country and what this election means to this country. You know, Andrew, I worry so much that talking about political violence can now fall along partisan lines. You know, why, 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 isn't, why isn't the concern of political violence 
a bipartisan concern? Um, wh why doesn't everybody see the danger and the direct line between what Trump says and what his followers do? I want to introduce another participant in this conversation. This is Stephen Ayer's testimony before the public January 6th Select Committee. I was hanging on every word he was saying. Everything he was putting out, I was following it. I mean, if I was doing it, hundreds of thousands or millions of other people are, are doing it, or maybe even still doing it. Um, it's like he just said about that. You know, you got people still following and doing that. Who knows what the next election could come out? You know, they end up, could end up being down the same path we are right now. I mean, just don't know. So because when that happened live, we weren't where we are on the calendar. It, it, it was the first part of the testimony that I hung on, right? But now that we are seven months out from an election, it's the last part of it that haunts me. Um, who knows what the next election could come out, you know? It could end up being down the same path we are right now. I mean, I just don't know. For Trump and on the right, they are one in the same. And Lisa constantly points that out for us because she's at the court where Trump is making his direct line communications to his supporters. But it, it does seem that Judge Mershon is very aware of the moment in which he is presiding over a criminal trial of Donald Trump. And I wonder how you assess sort of our, our state of readiness for what's about to happen, Andrew. So I think that we are dealing with people who have a view that the ends justify the means, even when we're talking about political violence, about threats of violence, even when we're talking about what happens to Nancy Pelosi's husband and people can't get bring themselves to condemn that. Even we're talking about the threats to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss for doing their job, um, threats to grand jurors for doing their job. I had the same view when I was working in the Mueller investigation about uh, um, foreign interference in our election. It, it was so incredible to me that you wouldn't think about that as an American. And it was not a political issue. It wouldn't be, oh, well, you know, foreign interference is fine as long as you're helping me. Um, that That is what we've devolved into where there's no principle at stake. Uh, I do think, though, in terms of um, the court, that we, in terms of the narrow picture, that we have a judge who knows exactly what he's dealing with and is taking the appropriate steps. Uh, I should also say that unlike other cases we've seen, I think you're going to see some very good lawyering on both sides. And that is the way it should be in a democracy with the rule of law. And regardless of what the defendant wants to say and claim, there is going to be due process in that courtroom. And that is what Judge Marshawn is going to do. And that is what the prosecution and the defense team are going to do. Um, so I think that in many ways, it should be for people who believe in the American system and the American justice system. Um, I think this should be a shining example um, of what we can do in this country in affording defendants' rights. And, the, and we'll see what happens. Um, that's where our system works. We'll see what the jury decides in terms of, of whether the, uh, the state has met its burden. But I think that this has all signs of being what our system is supposed to be about. Um, I want to deal with the Michael Cohen of this. He's just released a statement thanking the judge uh, for the gag order. It says this, quote, I want to thank Judge Mershon for imposing the gag order as I have been under relentless assault from Donald's MAGA supporters. Nevertheless, knowing Donald as well as I do, he will seek to defy the gag order by employing others within his circle to do his bidding, regardless of the consequence. Um, let, let me read. I, I'm going to sort of cherry pick this. Um, it has a racist attack. In it, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna read around um, Trump's missive. I mean, maybe I won't. He basically attacks everybody involved, and this is what Michael Cohen is talking about. He can't be restrained. He doesn't have any impulse control, and if he thinks there will be a political benefit, he'll violate any legal remedy in front of him. 
He will. And Nicole, I want to bring up one other legal remedy that Judge Mershon has imposed. You know, I, you and I were talking before the show started, and I compared today's gag order from Judge Mershon to the one that was upheld by the D.C. Circuit in Jack Smith's federal election interference case. That is the decision where the D.C. Circuit somewhat pulled back on Judge Chutkin's original gag order. The language here is almost identical to the gag order now approved by the D.C. Circuit with one exception. There's an extra provision here for the protection of jurors and prospective jurors. You might ask yourself, why is that necessary? It's necessary because in New York system, a defendant has a statutory right to know the names of the jurors before them. And while Judge Mershon has also entered a separate order providing for anonymous jury selection vis-a-vis -vis the public, he says here, while the protective order related to juror anonymity prevents the dissemination of certain personal information, it is not sufficient to prevent extrajudicial speech targeting jurors and exposing them to an atmosphere of intimidation. The proposed restrictions relating to jurors are narrowly tailored to obtain that result. I want to go back to what you said at the beginning about the fact that this is a person who is a former president and the presumptive Republican nominee, and yet we are talking about them and only them and their capacity to essentially torment and induce fear in the hearts of prospective jurors and actual jurors being convened to decide whether or not they have committed 34 separate felony counts in the state of New York. That's unfathomable to us, even a couple of years ago. The idea that we're reading this now, this is not normal. It should never be normal. I'm sorry that this is the third or fourth time it's been normalized. But we have to keep saying that, and I'm glad you do. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on Get or the Cloud icon and enjoy it.